Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our ninth virtual town hall, Standing Up to Hate and Bias. Before we get started, I'd like to run over a few housekeeping items so you all know how to participate in today's event. First, all lines are on mute. If you have a question, you will have the opportunity to text them into today's presenters. Please type in your thoughts into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send them in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them throughout the Q&A. Similar questions will be combined and inappropriate or offensive questions will not be announced. And due to time constraints, please keep all questions on topic. If you experience any technical difficulties at any point during our presentation, please explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Lastly, we are recording this town hall and the video will be available on our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please subscribe to New Jersey OAG on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr for the latest updates on news, information, and resources from our office. And now I'd like to hand things off to our host and moderator for today, Attorney General Kabir Graywall. Okay. Uh, thank you, Whitney, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us for what is now our ninth virtual 2121 town hall. The 2121 project stands for 21st Century Policing 21 Counties, and it's something we started in 2018 when we uh, started at the Attorney General's office as a way for law enforcement and communities to connect and discuss issues of mutual concern. This year, we had a pretty ambitious agenda for these town halls, but unfortunately, COVID-19 disrupted some of our plans to have in-person meetings. But we felt it was more important now than ever to stay connected, and we switched to this virtual format. And it's been incredibly successful. We have over 200 participants today to talk about how we could stand up to hate and combat bias. In New Jersey, over the last several years, we've seen a rise in bias crimes and bias offenses. And unfortunately, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw an increase in bias crimes targeting Asian Americans and other minority groups. And more recently, we've seen an uptick in bias offenses as well in the wake of the social unrest and, and the criminal justice issues that we're contending with as a country. We see individuals trying to take this opportunity as a moment to divide citizens and turn citizens against each other. And we have an incredible panel today to talk about these and other issues and talk about strategies to combat hate and bias. We're joined by Jared Maples, who's the director of the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. We have Rachel Wainer after who's the director of our Division on Civil Rights. And we have Weldon Powell, who's the chief of detectives for the state's Division of Criminal Justice. I want to get started right away with uh, Director Maples uh, and, and ask him some questions about his role and what he's seeing from his vantage point. So if we could welcome mm -hmm. Director Maples. Jared, thanks for joining the program. Uh, and let's, you know, let's get right to it. Can you just tell our viewers what OHSP does and what your role is in this particular moment? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me, General. It's an honor to be on here and, and certainly to all the viewers. Uh, so the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness has three primary mission areas. One is we lead and coordinate the state's counterterrorism efforts, the cybersecurity efforts of the state, and then also emergency preparedness. And under the emergency preparedness and counterterrorism is, is why I'm talking to, to you today about bias incidents, bias crimes, because what our role really is, is trying to prevent, build capability to prevent an attack from occurring, that violent aspect of it. Um, and as a result, we kind of get involved in a lot of these different areas, whether it be the reporting of, um, uh, of threats or attacks, um, whether it be the grant, building grant formulas to get money out to the various communities, not just communities of faith, but across all of our communities to try to build programs to deter and to prevent those attacks from occurring. And then when God forbid they do it occur, like happened in Jersey City, for example, or several other times in our state's history, to build community resilience and make sure that communities can overcome um, those challenges. So we do that through a lot of different mechanisms, but that's our overarching role. Um, one thing to highlight as well is we also have the Interfaith Advisory Council uh, the general and his team have been a fantastic partners in that effort in reaching out to our communities of faith, um, which unfortunately are largely uh, targeted in some of these campaigns, whether it be from white supremacist groups, whether it be from some of the other anti-government or chaos driving groups. Um, and it's something that we really focus on to, to prevent. 
something that we say often in these public forums is that hate has no place here in New Jersey. And I can't have a better partner than the Attorney General, his office, the state police, the DCJ, uh, criminal justice, uh, Rachel Wainer after who you'll hear from her team. Um, it really is a teamwork effort. Uh, it's partnership. That's how we're going to deter this. And from our office's perspective, we do a lot of work, obviously, with the partners I just named, but also federal and local partners as well and departments. Um, and then private sector, the community groups that I talked about. This is truly a whole of state issue. It's a whole of state problem. And the only way we're going to get through it is by that whole estate approach. So I appreciate the opportunity again and looking forward to the questions. Thanks, Sheridan. And, and that really is the key to so many of the problems we're dealing with, whether it's uh, issues of bias or hate. It's the collaboration that we enjoy uh, across state government, across uh, federal government with our, our stakeholders uh, and, and faith based partners. Uh, and that's where the solution is going to be found to this problem. W what I'd like to ask you about uh, is, is a term that we heard a lot about right now uh, in the midst of COVID-19, uh, and that's disinformation and rumors related to COVID-19 uh, and other areas. Uh, can you give the public some uh, some information about what disinformation means to you and, and what are some of the ways that OHSP is working to stop these campaigns, both for COVID-19 and more broadly even now, uh, as we're seeing uh, protests around issues of criminal justice reform, policing reform. Um, you know, we're seeing that, um, Folks are trying to use uh, the present moment and, and the crises that we're contending with as a country to divide people along racial and social and political lines. Uh, and so what are you seeing and what are you doing about it from your perspective? No, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question and glad to, glad to highlight some of the roles that we're playing in that realm. Um, early on in the COVID crisis, we recognized that there were coordinated campaigns. It really did start with that. There was a text message that was sent out and a lot of community members, a lot of public leaders, a lot of private sector leaders were reaching out to me personally. I know you, General, and, and various mem other members of our public safety network uh, to see about if they were true. And that text message string started out again as a text message and essentially said that the federal government was going to install this lockdown and we'd have martial law on the streets and you'd be uh, remanded essentially to your properties. It was completely false. Um, it was meant to sow panic and, and discontent. And I can't get into the specifics of where that originated from, but it was from a foreign government. We traced that back uh, through our abilities. And we wanted to put that message out there to the public that, no, this isn't a real thing. It's, it's fake. Um, but then that led us down this path of, wow, there's an awful lot of misinformation, disinformation out there. Uh, again, it started with more of the state-based actor, but we quickly moved into a realm where we saw white supremacist groups, for example, and some of the race-based issue groups and some of the extremist groups across the board trying to sow that panic and discontent, many of whom want to bring down government, for example, and not have, you know either restrict our ability to react to the coronavirus crisis. Again, that's kind of where it started. But as the general mentioned, it turned into everything from, as you look back to election security, uh, elections themselves, you look back to the, dis the, the issues that are happening right now from a civil unrest perspective, speaking of bias and and all the incidents we're trying to respond to and, and deal with. And all of that is creating this, this boiling cauldron of disinformation. And so we've tried to do a couple different things. One, we put together a web page early on and coordinated the state's disinformation campaign. So we wanted to put it in one place. One, call it out that it's happening, whether it be a text message or social media or recruiting events or all these different things we see from all the variety of groups. And then two, explaining exactly how it's, how it's wrong, how it's false, so that people can gain that trust in government. We're putting that out there as a trust mechanism to know, you know, in the communities that you can come to the right place for the right sources, the right information, because it really is important, whether it be a reputable media organization or a government entity, we wanna make sure that we're transparent, we're clear, we're direct, and you're getting only the right information. Uh, and so that became a, a real key driver, again, not just in coronavirus, as the general mentioned, but also the unrest that we're dealing with today um, it is, I, I mentioned in a, a, a call with the congressional de delegation the other day, it is one of a kind of a perfect storm of threat because every group that's trying to cause panic, cause discontent, cause distrust in the government is all jumping in on the same wavelength. So they're using, again, the social media networks, all these different aspects. So it really is important and vital, quite frankly, to get the information from only the right and reputable sources. And certainly we're proud and happy to help provide that link from the state of New Jersey. That's incredibly important work so people have this trusted resource. I mean, you have analysts that are constantly monitoring social media and looking for this type of disinformation uh, to work, I, I guess, uh, with the social media companies to identify it. Uh, where can people find this resource uh, and, and what is your, you know, we'll share it in the handouts, but can you just uh, 
give a plug for your website and, and other platforms where people can find this trusted information? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I'm definitely happy to do that. So at our website, uh, at www.njohsp.gov, that's our main website, we actually have kept that disinformation. It's so important to us to get that message out that we've kept that front and center. So as you open the page, the link is right there. Uh, it's one click away, and it is a full resource, a full suite of resources. Again, the fact that these disinformation campaigns are there, what they actually are outlining the falsehoods, and then more importantly, and probably most importantly, what to do about it, where you can report things, where you can go to get better information. There's a lot of forums out there, and we wanna make sure you have the right resources available. So it's a full suite of resources there on that webpage. And there's also multiple tabs throughout that. So everything from videos to, again, outlining the social media threats and, and, and what the issues are out there. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, in your earlier answer, um, the Interfaith Advisory Council. Before I get to that, um, you also talked about um, white supremacist activity in New Jersey. Uh, I know uh, New Jersey OHSP releases a um, annual terrorism threat assessment, uh, and you raise the level of the white uh, supremacist uh, extremist threat level in New Jersey from moderate to high. Uh, why did you do that? And, and how can the public stay more informed about organized hate group activity in New Jersey? Yeah, so we did raise that, and we're actually the first state in the country to elevate them to a heightened level. Most states do produce some sort of a threat assessment of varying degrees of length and uh, uh, content. We put a pretty robust product out. It's approximately 40 pages, and we are the first state to really elevate them up to a higher level. And the reason we did that, and I should mention as well, the other highest threat level is homegrown violent extremists, often whom take uh, they're not directed by an overseas terrorist group, but they're inspired by it a lot of times. And it's turned into some of the domestic-based actors have inspired other people to act. Why we raised the white supremacist uh, threat up to that level is a, it's really threefold. One is we do a very complex algorithms, a metric in, in our analytical product. You mentioned our team of analysts. I, I think they're second to none at the state level and, and potentially even the federal level in many regards um, from what they can do. Their output is just incredible. And it was the, through this algorithm, we look at everything from recruiting to flyering to incidents to graffiti incidents. Um, one thing stands out in Wyckoff, of course, your home county general, there was the, the anti-Asian uh, uh, graffiti incident that happened just the other day. And it, those type of incidents are all plugged into this algorithm. Unfortunately, in New Jersey, we have a lot. We, and, and you know this all too well. Um, we, we really do have a lot of those and a lot of people reporting, which is a good thing. We need to know about them. Um, but all those things come into play. The groups that are present in our state um, we have one of the, it's not a, it's a dubious distinction, but one of the, the leaders in the white nationalist, white supremacist movement right now is the NJEHA, the European Heritage Association. And you see them, they're almost, they're, they're stickers everywhere. Um, they're putting a lot of recruiting flyery material on college campuses. They sort of show up at these events. Um, and they're actually on, on the top five to 10 groups nationally, as far as their output on social media, for example, and some of the other things that they do. But there's a lot of other groups out there, the traditional like KKK, the not so traditional that you may or may not have heard of, like the Adam Waffen Division, for example. We have presence in, in New Jersey. And so you couple that with the attacks that have happened across the country, and there's been a lot of them. Um, one that jumps out at the top of mind, of course, is the El Paso shooting. It was an anti-Latino uh, shooting and, and incident that went out. There are plenty more. Um, the Gilroy Garlic Festival. There's been, a, um, you know, then you look at the anti-Semitic shootings like Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Um, you know, I can go down the list, unfortunately, uh, ad nauseum here, um, but all of those incidents package in together that when you see a heightened geographic location, a heightened presence from a graffiti, uh, you know, recruiting, flyering, and then you see that heightened presence of the attacks themselves and the fact that those folks and those groups are present and active in New Jersey, um, it, it all put together into that algorithm and led us to basically taking a national leadership role in saying, look, this is a real problem. This is something we view as a, as a high level threat. One of the great aspects of doing that is it opens up certain funding streams. It allows us to get access to funding streams to combat that threat. Um, again, in partnership with your office, for example, General, the State Police, again, the DCJ, all these great partners we have, and really work together to try to combat that. Use grant funding to, to directly go against that. Um, for example, the non nonprofit and faith-based groups, it allows us to get more money and more money on the streets and more money into your communities to help protect your facilities and your people. Jared, uh, thanks for that overview. I'm going to circle back with you uh, after we talk to our other panelists uh, for, for, uh, for their perspective. But before I switch to Rachel Weiner after from our Division on Civil Rights, 
Uh, you mentioned uh, the New Jersey European Heritage Association. Uh, are you seeing them present at um, events related to COVID-19, or do you see them taking advantage of the current, oper uh, current pandemic uh, as a recruiting uh, opportunity? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. Yes, we, the answer is yes, we are. The, I think to highlight the biggest example we have of that is probably the Belmar situation with the gym. Um, they were present. The, the, somebody, an astute member of our community pointed out that the sticker, the NJEHA sticker on the bullhorn, uh, was, was on the bullhorn that was used in that protest. And that was a protest about COVID and some of the, relate, the actions that have happened across the state to try to secure and protect our state, flatten the curve, um, get rid of this virus. Uh, but more importantly, the president or the leader, it depends on the title who you ask. Um, I don't know what he'd probably refer to himself as, but the, the leader of the NJEHA was actually in that parking lot among several other members. That's one example. Yeah. There have been plenty of others that have been taken advantage. Uh, the word I used, I was interviewed yesterday in a, by the media, and, and I used the word opportunism. They, they're, they're opportunists, and they're taking advantage of people's fears, um, people's concerns. Again, maybe discontent, maybe issues, panic. They're taking advantage yeah. of that right now, and that's something we're seeing across the state and, quite frankly, the country. Yeah, and Jared, uh, one final point. We're seeing an uptick in this activity. The numbers are high in New Jersey, but I think you hit on it, and I think the public should know. Uh, it's not because I think New Jersey has an outsized problem with right. bias and hate. Certainly, we have our issues, but it's because of work that you do and, and our other partners do, like the Division of Criminal Justice, uh, on reporting and encouraging reporting. So if folks are seeing this activity, uh, who should they call? Certainly, if they're in danger, 911, but is right. there another place where they could report this activity? They can. So that's one of the unique pieces uh, of, of our state that, that is different than any other state. All leads and suspicious activity reports are coordinated through our office, the Counterterrorism Watch Desk. It's co-located at the Regional Operations Intelligence Center, the ROC. Um, and that, that desk literally coordinates every threat throughout the state. So if you do call 911, and, and absolutely, if there is an emergency or an urgent situation, use your 911 network. But any report that comes from the community or law enforcement, whether it be 911 or a traditional mechanism, like our, our hotline, for example, one 866 nj or by emailing tips at njohsp.gov, or again, going to the, to the your local police department, all those tips and leads um, underneath the attorney general's directive that you updated, General, a few years ago, those all come to my office and they're coordinated with FBI and the federal partners all the way down to the local level almost immediately. It's literally a touch of a button and everyone's in the loop at once. So it's really important that we do hear about incidents, whether they be graffiti or, and some of those don't turn into terrorism cases. Some of them are, yeah. are pushed down to the, uh, the local level or quite frankly, DCJ for onward prosecution. We have a great partnership with uh, your team, as you know. And, and so all those type, of, those type of efforts are coordinated in that one spot. And uh, we encourage the wide reporting. If you see something, truly say something. Thanks, Jared. Uh, if we could now turn to, to Rachel Wainer after uh, from our Division on Civil Rights. Hello. Hi, General. Hey, Rachel. Th thank you so much for joining us. And uh, first and foremost, before we get into the topic at hand, uh, we had a successful uh, decision today from the Supreme Court in the DACA case. Uh, I want to congratulate you and your team because you led the fight on behalf of New Jersey, uh, took the fight to federal court in Texas to stand up for the state's uh, immigrant communities. So uh, congratulations on a job well done, but not on a job that's done completely. Correct. It was a truly um, incredible result from the Supreme Court. Um, but as you said, it struck down the Trump administration's efforts to rescind DACA now, but it did not mean that DACA could never be rescinded. Um, in effect, it gave the Trump administration another chance to attempt to rescind again. But well, we're lucky to have lawyers like you who are going to be vigilant and, and are leading the effort here on behalf of New Jersey. But you're in a new role now. Uh, as the director of our state's Division on Civil Rights. Can you tell our audience what the role of the Division on Civil Rights is in New Jersey and what your, uh, what tools you have at your disposal to, to stand up for our residents? Of course. Um, so the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights um, enforces our state civil rights law, the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination. Um, and it is actually the first state level civil rights law to go into effect after reconstruction. It turned 75 years old this year. Um, and it is still one of the broadest. You might have heard that earlier this week, the US Supreme Court decided that Title VII, the federal civil rights law, protected against discrimination based on 
sexual orientation and gender identity and expression um, after many years. New Jersey law, the law against discrimination, has already included those protections um, for many years. So we are very grateful that the law in New Jersey is so strong and that we are able to use it to protect our residents from both discrimination and bias-based harassment. So just to briefly summarize, the law prevents discrimination and bias-based harassment in investigation, in, um, I'm sorry, in employment, in housing, and in places of public accommodation. Places of public accommodation generally include any place open to the public. So it could be a school, a medical facility, a government officer or um, office. It could be a business, a restaurant, et cetera. Um, and we at the Division on Civil Rights are charged with preventing and eliminating bias-based uh, discrimination and harassment across the state. And in order to do that, we accept individual complaints. So if anyone believes that they were the target of discrimination or bias-based harassment, either at their job, in housing, or in a place of public accommodation, they can come file a complaint with our office and we then have neutral investigators who undertake an investigation um, and we can prosecute a violation if we find that any violation has occurred. Um, but we also take a much broader view of what it means to prevent and eliminate discrimination in the state of New Jersey. Um, and so I'll talk just about um, a few pieces of that one is we issue reports on important civil rights issues. So last year, um, at the end of last summer, we issued a report on bias and hate incidents in New Jersey that did not only analyze the data about the dramatic rise in bias incidents, but also analyze why we might be seeing this rise. Factors um, that Director Maples um, already discussed, like social media, the rise in hate groups, um, political rhetoric, um, et cetera. And then that report directly led to the governor's creation of the Interagency Task Force to Combat Youth Bias. Um, and I was um, very, very honored to be able to chair that task force and we held listening sessions across the state in November and December of last year where we heard from people who have been impacted by bias both individual bias but also systemic bias one of the things that came across most from parents and students and community members who came and spoke to members of the task force at these listening sessions was that you can't talk about hate and bias without also talking about systemic racism and systemic bias um, so that is another big big area where GCR is involved and then the third proactive um, measure that I will briefly discuss is one that was just announced a few weeks ago. We are beginning um, just opening a civil rights incident response team, which will act as mediators and um, community relations specialists to really develop relationships with communities across New Jersey um, during good days um, so that when civil rights incidents occur, we at DCR can step in and help to bring people together and provide mediation and restorative justice services. And so we are really excited about that and we should have job postings um, for that team um, posted very shortly. Yeah, I think that is a great development for this state, and it's a way in which our Division on Civil Rights is doing such great proactive work uh, in addition to reacting to uh, complaints that you receive. And it was important to the governor, I know, uh, to to really transform our Division on Civil Rights. And I thank you for everything that you're, you're doing, in particular with this new uh, incident response team. You referenced the report from last year. Uh, can you just broadly share some of the trends uh, that you've seen in this state uh, and what what is particularly troubling um, from those trends? For me, I, I know it's the, the youth bias uh, and the issues that we're seeing among young people, but I'd love to get your perspective if you could share it with our audience. Yes, so um, one of the things that the report discussed in detail was um, a large increase in bias incidents that we saw both between 2016 and 2017, and then again, 2018 to 2019. And um, the you actually, in January, released preliminary data from 2019 that showed an even more dramatic um, increase. And while some of that can be attributable to amazing work that um, the Attorney General's Office has done 
and the Division on Criminal Justice has done and our office has done on encouraging people to report, um, some of it is also that there actually is, um, and scholars have studied this, there actually is a rise in bias and hate over the past uh, several years. And it's not necessarily a rise in bias existing because, as I said, one of the things that the Youth Bias Task Force learned um, so much during our sessions is that you can't talk about interpersonal bias without talking about systemic bias. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that people learn at a very, very young age. Um, however, it's more that people are feeling free to act on their biases, either with screaming racial slurs or painting swastikas or the incident um, that Director Maples um, referenced at the Chinese restaurant um, a few days ago. So people seem to be feeling more free to act on their bias. And the report discussed some of the reasons for this. Um, as I mentioned, social media, um, political rhetoric, and the rise in hate groups. Um, but I agree with you that the rise in bias incidents, both committed by young people and against young people, um, is really one of the most troubling things that we have seen in recent years. And how easy it is for something like this to really tear apart a school community. And that's something that we've continued to see while students are learning virtually. Um, this has not gone away. Instead, this has been an issue on Zoom classes. This has been an issue um, using text messages and TikTok. Um, students have really been, um, have not been safe from this type of bias-based harassment just because we're not physically in school. Yeah, I've always felt to that point um, with, with all this technology, uh, young people and people in general are saying things and hateful things and doing th engaging acts of bias that they ordinarily wouldn't do face to face. Uh, it's somehow, particularly their young people, it's a failure to understand um, how it's the same, whether you do it in person or online, uh, that it has the same effect uh, on the individual. It, it has potentially the same criminality, depending on what the conduct is, uh, and perhaps even additional charges. And um, I know the Youth Bias Task Force uh, did some meaningful work, and there's a, a report that will be forthcoming with solutions, so I don't want to get too, too much into that, but this can't be dismissed as kids being kids, because uh, the, the danger is, from my perspective, is that it later uh, the conduct could escalate. And I've seen how young people started uh, with just words and, and, and graduated, let's say, as they proceeded through the education system to violence uh, and really just cowardly and hateful acts. So I want to thank you for your work there. Um, you know, you mentioned two concepts. You, you, you differentiated between hate and bias and how you can't talk about hate or bias um, without talking about systemic racism or s systemic inequality. Uh, can you just explain the difference between the two and then perhaps give us your strategies on what individuals and communities can do uh, to address both hate and systemic issues that they're seeing right now? Um, of course. So I think it is important to distinguish um, between the two. Individual acts of bias or hate can often manifest themselves in explicit ways. Someone spray painting a swastika on a street, posting a video of themselves in blackface um, with the word slave on TikTok, spray painting um, COVID-19 go back to China on a Chinese restaurant. Um, but systemic racism refers to the systems in place that create and maintain racial inequality in nearly every facet of life for people of color. So that includes wealth, employment, housing, the criminal justice system, healthcare, and education. Um, it makes it more challenging for people of color to participate equally in society and in the economy. Um, and I just want to give one example from housing, because I think it makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, beginning in 1934, so before World War II, um, the Federal Housing Administration refused to insure mortgages in or near African-American neighborhoods, a policy that um, became known as redlining. Um, at the same time, the FHA was subsidizing builders who were mass producing suburbs, um, but 
only for white residents. There were explicit requirements that none of the homes be sold to black people. Um, so the underwriting manual of the FHA at the time even said that incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. Um, that policy meant that it was fundamentally impossible for black and brown people to buy homes in suburbs or build home equity. Um, and it became an active way of enforcing segregation. And that policy um, continued into the 1940s, 1950s, and even into the 1960s. And it has had a profound lasting impact in terms of wealth, education, and countless other factors. Um, in terms of what individuals and communities can do to address both systemic racism and bias and hate, um, I think that there are a few pieces. One is education, and this is something that the Youth Bias Task Force is um, really dealing with intimately, and we look forward to the release of the task force's report. Uh, but even for adults, um, systemic racism and white privilege is not a topic that enough white people are comfortable talking about, um, but we will never be able to address it if we can't even discuss it. Um, so educating yourself on systemic racism um, and doing your own research and not expecting friends or colleagues who are people of color to do the work for you um, is incredibly important. Um, I think in terms of personal biases, it's also really important to learn about your, how you yourself might engage in stereotype thinking without even knowing about it. And this is something that we all do without realizing. Um, it's a term called implicit bias, and it refers to attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understandings and our actions in an unconscious way that we don't understand. Um, so it's a natural part of our brain because people are exposed to millions of pieces of information per second and our brains cannot consciously process all of the pieces of information that we are exposed to. Um, and so our brains do a lot of unconscious processing based on unconscious associations that our brains use as mental shortcuts. Um, but some of the mental shortcuts that our brains use might be inaccurate um, and they can lead to harm. So just for some examples, um, applicants with white sounding names um, have gotten 50% more callbacks than applicants with black sounding names with identical resumes in employment tests. Um, US doctors have been found to recommend less pain medication for black or Latinx patients than for white patients with the same injury. Um, and this is related to maternal mortality um, rates as well. Um, white participants in one study were found to perceive black faces as more threatening than white faces with the exact same expression. Um, and one example from the 1970s, um, instituting blind auditions for women, especially where they added carpet so that you could not hear the sound of women's high heels, um, led to 50% more callbacks for female musicians. And women went from being only 5% of members of the top five US symphony orchestras to 25% of the members in a period of a few years with this one simple change. Um, so. So we can only control our own biases if we are aware of them and becoming aware of your own biases is re therefore really important. Project Implicit from Harvard has tests designed to reveal biases that you may, may have based on race, gender, disability, age, religion, weight, national origin. Um, and so it's really important to for all of us, me included, to try to learn about our own biases and then make a conscious effort to disrupt them. Um, that means pausing and thinking before acting, questioning our initial assumptions, um, and trying to take our biases into account and then act only according to our conscious values, not according to our unconscious um, assumptions. So that is an important way that individuals, um, I think, can address hate and bias. When it comes to communities and work environments. Um, Dr. King said that people fail to get along because they fear each other, they fear each other because they don't know each other, and they don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Um, and in truth, the best way to break down stereotypes and implicit bias is by 
real, authentic, meaningful relationships with individual people. Um, so you could plan a panel discussion, even on Zoom, with another church or mosque or synagogue in your town. Uh, people can do that with your own um, workout class or children's sports teams or other social networks, um, again, even electronically. Um, these conversations are taking place all around us and really allow us the opportunity to interact with and learn from one another. Um, one other thing that I'll say is we all spend most of, or a lot of us spend most of our days at work, um, even during this era of mass teleworking, um, and we're still engaging and interfacing with colleagues. So being willing to become active in promoting um, anti-discrimination policies at work and being open to how um, you and others might be um, participating in, in biases and can play a role in eradicating biases is also incredibly important. Well, Rachel, thank you for, for sharing those strategies. Uh, I think leaning into those uncomfortable conversations that you just talked about is important. Uh, it helps us understand each other, uh, understand issues in a different way. Uh, but the the implicit bias uh, tests that are out there, I would encourage uh, folks to take these IATs uh, because they are eye-opening. All of us have some sort of implicit bias. And, and the key strategy there is to slow down, recognize it, and not act on it. Uh, and that's something that uh, the viewers should know. Uh, all of our state troopers in New Jersey received in, in person uh, implicit bias training. And I don't know of any other uh, law enforcement organization of that size that went through that type of training. And the feedback was tremendous. Uh, it led to very good, positive developments and conversations. Uh, but also all of our state's prosecutors uh, have received implicit bias training as well. Uh, and we are rolling out different forms of this training uh, to leaders across uh, the Department of Law and Public Safety, uh, folks involved in hiring, uh, to make sure we're recognizing our own implicit subconscious biases and never acting on them. So uh, thank you for sharing those strategies. Uh, really quickly, if we have something to report to the Division on Civil Rights, how do we do it? Yes, so everyone um, can go to our website, um, njcivilrights.gov, and there are resources right on the front page about specifically how civil rights laws impact COVID-19 and your civil rights during the pandemic. And then there are also resources for how to contact our office um, while we are communicating with complainants electronically rather than in person. And that's all right on the front page of our website. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. We'll come back to you uh, in a moment. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, the Chief of Detectives for our Division of Criminal Justice, uh, Weldon Powell. Weldon, welcome and thanks. Thanks for hanging on with us. There you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you, General, and thank you for having me today. I'm always excited to talk about our efforts to combat bias crimes and incidents throughout the state. Well, th and, thank you for joining us, Weldon. Can you just give folks a perspective on um, about the Division of Criminal Justice, its role, and your role as the Chief of Detectives there? Yes. Uh, as, as Chief of Detectives, I'm responsible for managing several investigative divisions, um, none more important than the Bias Crimes Unit. And, mm -hmm. and although managing the Bias Crimes Unit has been a little dif difficult during the pandemic and the unfortunate events surrounding George Floyd, uh, the Bias Crimes Unit has an excellent blueprint for combating bias crimes throughout the state. And that blueprint is found in our investigative, uh, our investigative I'm sorry, our investigative standards. Um, a, it, it call, it's a blueprint for how we investigate bias incidents and crimes throughout the state. And that blueprint calls for one uniformity of investigations by law enforcement organizations throughout the state. So what's done in Sussex County to investigate bias crimes and bias incidents is also done in Cape May County. It also has an education component, and the education component uh, requires us to educate law enforcement and the public as to how to submit and identify bias incidents to the state. What I feel is the most important of, of the investigation uh, standards is the requirement of law enforcement to submit bias incidents to the Attorney General's office that are submitted to them by the public. This allows us to disseminate that information to a lot of our investigative partners in the, bias, in the fight against bias crimes, such as the Division on Civil Rights, the 21 County Prosecutor's Offices, and State Police and Homeland Security. 
Can I, can I jump in there, uh, Weldon, for a second? You used a couple of terms, bias incidents and bias crimes. And, you know, the director talked about the, the overview of national organizations and recruitment efforts by uh, organized groups. And Rachel talked about uh, what she sees in public accommodation. And now we're getting uh, to the nuts and bolts uh, of when, when people on the ground are victimized uh, by acts of bias. Can you just distinguish between the two bias incidents and bias crimes? Yes, a, a, a bias incident may or may not be a bias crime. The best example I can give, give of a, a bias incident is the parking space example. And that is two individuals are vying for the same parking space. Um, one individual gets it, and then the other individual who didn't get it calls that individual a name, uses an epithet, a racial epithet. That's not necessarily a bias crime. It becomes a bias crime when the intent becomes to intimidate based on race, and it's, there's an underlying predicate crime associated with that, such as assault, harassment, and it's purely directed based on race, national origin, sexual orientation, religion, color, gender, and other protected classes. Thank you for that distinction. We have a question from the audience, uh, which I think sort of fits here. Uh, you talked about the 21 county prosecutors um, and that they have biased crimes officers. Um, or some may not have chosen one. Are we doing something to make sure that there, there are bias crime officers in each of our 21 counties? Absolutely. We, we have daily meetings and each is required, according to the investigative, investigative standards, to have a bias crime liaison in each county prosecutor's office. And we liaison with them and communicate information down to them. Such, for example, at the onset of the COVID crisis, we feared that we would get an uptick in Asian bias cases. So we communicate it down to each county prosecutor's office. Be, be aware and message down to your police departments that there may be an uptake in Asian bias incidents. Is there a way um, that maybe, you know, to the, the viewer's question, our, our county prosecutors could put information about their bias crimes unit uh, on their websites? Is that a conversation you can have with them? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah. And um, I, be I believe, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, they can be posted on each of their websites and, and our website as well. We can get that posted on our website too. Well, th thank you for that, Weldon. Uh, you mentioned an uptick, potentially we're concerned about bias offenses against Asian Americans in the wake uh, of COVID-19. Uh, what are the trends in New Jersey? What have you seen uh, since the pandemic took hold uh, in early March? Well, since the pandemic took hold, uh, we definitely have seen an uptick in the Asian bias uh, um, incidents. And what we did to identify that was we moved to uh, isolate or, or do a subset of bias incidents that we received. So we created what we call the COVID report. And the COVID report is just isolates in bias incidents directly related to the pandemic. First was Asian. And we see a, a, a lot of hate directed at other groups as well. Um, you know, as you're aware, whenever you have a pandemic, you have fear uh, and anxiety. Not far behind fear and anxiety is bias and racism. So we'll, we, saw, we saw uptick in Asian-based um, bias incidents and bias crimes, and also just an uptick uh, of incidents directed towards African Americans and also Italian Americans. And, and you know, you talked about the reporting. Um, you know. How can folks report bias incidents or bias crimes uh, to the Division of Criminal Justice? One, they can go to our website and they can report, put it directly to us using our uh, the web address of njbias at njdcj.org. But we would prefer if they if they report, reported it directly to their uh, local law enforcement organization or, or law enforcement department because th that allows us. Uh, to, to start the investigation at the grassroots level, at the most basic level. And it also allows us to get a bias incident report for tracking purposes. Now, uh, what, what happens, what's the next step once an incident report comes in? Let's say you got one in, uh, even though, you know, somebody should probably go first to 911 or, or locally, but say it's, it's something that comes in through the CJ uh, email address or another way. What happens next? What do you do with that information and how to, how does this investigation play out? We immediately make contact with the victim or the person that submitted the, the incident report to us. So we have one of our detectives reach out to the individual to confirm um, the uh, 
of the circumstances of the bias incident. Secondly, we make contact with the local jurisdiction. We make sure we contact the local police department to see if they got a report of the incident or they're aware of the incident. If they're not, we have them take a report and submit the bias in, in, uh, supplementary report to us. But they're, they're, we make immediate contact with that individual and begin an independent investigation. And so um, what if it, it, it's not a criminal matter? Does your work stop there or, or do you have other options? No, we'll, 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 we will, in some cases, we may have to make a referral to our division on civil rights. It may not rise to the level of a crime, but it still may rise to the level of some type of discriminatory violation. And that's uh, the, the glory in our system. We have great communication with our other agencies, such as Homeland Security, Division on Civil Rights, and in other agencies, we can refer the person if we can't help them. You know, uh, going back to the pandemic, with the pandemic, I, you know, we've seen in certain types of crimes that reporting goes down because, you know, people are at home or people don't have access uh, to, to, or they think their police stations are not open to receive complaints. Um, have, have you uh, taken steps uh, to be proactive in the midst of the pandemic to encourage reporting? Absolutely. One of the first moves that we made was to communicate with the county prosecutors and the local police departments <clears throat> to, to, to um, ensure that they were still taking bias incident reports. In some cases, that may be the only contact that we have with the victim due to um, quarantine protocols. So we wanted to ensure that all of our law enforcement partners were aware that you know, we're still taking bias incident reports and these reports are necessary during this pandemic. You know, Weldon, sometimes people uh, might be dismissive that it's just, as I mentioned, a Rachel kids being kids or it's not that big of a deal. Um, is it important to report even minor incidents? Absolutely. We want to meet that activity where it is. We want to start the investigation where it is. If we can meet it at its lowest level, we can stop the escalation and stop the biggest events. I always say that our best success are in the headlines that you don't see. You know, I, I think uh, and all the speakers have talked about the, the, the robust reporting and tracking and sharing of information that New Jersey does. Uh, and, and your point is the absolute right one. We've got to report, report, report. Something might seem minor to you, uh, but it might fit in with something that, you know, you're seeing as a larger trend uh, across the state. And so you could better deploy uh, your resources. So uh, I want to thank you for, for CJ's approach uh, and, and partnership with our other uh, partners on this call. Um, I'll ask you one more question, and then I, I want to bring all the panelists up to have a, a couple of group questions. Um, Director Maples fielded questions on um, on about the uh, rise in white supremacist uh, organizations and activity. Uh, what can you share about CJ's approach to dealing with hate group activity? First, it begins with our, our, our we are seeing that rise in, in hate group activity in COVID-19 is the perfect fertile ground for uh, these white supremacists. Uh, first and foremost, it begins with our communication, our communication to Homeland Security on certain bias incidents. Um, every week, we get a report from Homeland Security and we give Homeland Security a report on what we're seeing in terms of different organizations. Then it comes in our coordination of investigative activity to make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes if we identify a target. We want to make sure that we're maximizing our investigative resources and everybody's working together in a cooperative fashion to investigate um, these, these particular groups. But you'll see at the lowest level, even with the bias incident reporting system, that you can, we, we began to sort of not monitor, but sort of pay attention to certain uh, uh, bias incidents that we get in terms of recruitment for, for these groups. And, and that's an indicator that they're active in our area. And to your point, and, and, and Jared had this point earlier, this recruitment's happening. It's happening at Rutgers. It's happening on our, our state universities. So we've got to be vigilant. Um, before we kick it back to uh, more of a group discussion, Weldon, um, you know, I want to thank you for your passion, uh, not just uh, when it comes to bias crimes, but just, you know, to be a proactive leader uh, in law enforcement. I, I know you have a passion uh, when it comes to bias crimes to 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 do everything you can uh, from your perspective to root out this conduct because uh, as director maples likes to say hate has no place in this state uh, and and it's because of efforts that you've undertaken in your current role uh, 
uh, that I think our state is safer and that we're making progress. So I'm really appreciative of everything that you're doing and that CJ is doing. Your detectives are incredible uh, and they do hard work each and every day, even in the midst of the pandemic. And so uh, you have a great team there. It's an honor uh, for me to work with each of you uh, and our incredible detectives who just this week, uh, you took down uh, a violent criminal organization in Trenton in the midst of a pandemic. And so it's just terrific work. Um, any last uh, information you want to share before we go to the group uh, conversation? Let me just use my time to throw it back to you, General. Um, it, it's an honor to work for somebody who really is, is equally as passionate about eradicating okay. bias, incidents, and bias crimes throughout the state. Recent, which a recent update of the bias investigation standards, which I think is one of the best blueprints in the nation for reducing bias criminal, bias crime, and bias incident activity throughout the state. Thank you, Weldon. Uh, and if we could, Whitney, can we uh, bring back all our speakers? And uh, one of our speakers is not muted and might be on a personal phone call, so they should know that. And one of our speakers has changed locations. <laughs> well, uh, welcome back, Jared. Thank you for staying with us uh, uh, through this um, through this conversation. Um, you know, let me uh, share ask you a question, uh, uh, Jared, that came from uh, one of our audience members, uh, and it relates to white supremacist activity that you touched on. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, can you define who white nationalists are, what they stand for? and approximately how many exist in our country and in our state? Yeah. So first of all, since the Division of Highway Safety reports to you, General, I am I was wearing my seatbelt when we were moving. Uh, but <laughs> we're parked outside the governor's press conference. I'm gonna duck into after this. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I did wanna caveat my remarks with that, that piece. Um, so as far as the white supremacist movement, uh, what it is, it really, it, it's, it's sort of ad hoc in many regards, but largely it is that the white race is, is uh, supreme. Um, it factors in everything from, from historical groups like Nazis, so neo-Nazism, um, the KKK and the deep-rooted deep -rooted issues in the South in this country that have moved throughout our country to 50 states. But essentially the idea is that they're, they're, the white race is supreme and, and that all of their races, all their religions and all of their, everything that doesn't abide by their kind of ideology is, is uh, substandard to them or, or, or below them, which of course is patently false and ridiculous. But it is the general ideology that, that guides them all together. Um, as far as in our state, I, I will say it is prevalent, but it isn't overwhelming. There's, you know, we don't know, we don't know exactly because quite frankly, it can be difficult. If somebody doesn't identify themselves, a lot of times they hide in the shadows, um, you know, and, and that, you know, Chief Powell talked about that. Uh, uh, Rachel Wainer after talked about that. The general talked about that. They'd sort of hide in the shadows oftentimes that these organized groups don't. And so we know that there are at least in the hundreds uh, across our state, potentially into the low thousands, but of folks that go across and they, they conduct protests uh, in New York and Philadelphia, they go to, there was a, a, a relatively good number of people in Charlottesville um, on, the, on the opposite side, of course, the bad side um, that, that protested. So we do have it, it's prevalent. I wouldn't say it's overwhelming, but they pack a punch because of social media, et cetera. And I would say the same across the country, you know, the, the groups are, uh, limited in overall size, but they certainly can scale up, scale up, and use the tools at their disposal to get their message of hate out there. And that's what it is. It's hate, guys. It's not, um, again, not acceptable here in New Jersey. It never will be. And I, I know the resources of everyone on this panel are going to go after and make sure that that doesn't have a place here in New Jersey. Can, can you just touch uh, briefly? You talked about the Interfaith Advisory Council earlier in your remarks. Um, we've talked about a lot of issues. Um, sometimes our houses of worship are targets. Uh, and whether it's graffiti or other uh, type of uh, bias motivated conduct, um, you know, how, how is the IAC uh, a tool and resource for you to get information out or uh, share strategies and, and mitigate uh, the number of bias crimes and offenses we're seeing? And, and what are some of the things you've done there with the IAC? Sure. Well, so several several areas and, you know, with the IAC, there's 3,500 members. Every faith in New Jersey is rec um, represented by that group. Most of the leadership teams from every major religion and, and some of the minor ones, some of the subset ones that don't have as broad a footprint. 
Um, so what it means is they can all get together with us, with us in law enforcement. And General, you and I spoke to the, that group um, in the immediacy of, of the Jersey City attacks, for example, um, in, in Mercer County. And we get that group together quarterly. And then we also get that group together virtually um, upon incidents or issues. We spoke to them frequently throughout this COVID crisis, for example, and giving that group the information that we think they needed and, and what they want. You know, we had question and answer, make sure we get information out there. Um, and try to get it get it out to them as quickly and, and expediently as possible so they can protect their communities. Um, so one is that interface, that info sharing piece. Two is when there are issues, it's an incredible opportunity for that group to get to cabinet level members like you, General, myself, uh, Colonel Callahan's joined us. Um, you know, of course, First Assistant uh, Davenport's been with us amongst all of our county prosecutors, Chief Powell, uh, you know, Rachel's been, everybody's been there and it gives them access to groups that they may not have access to. So if they have issues, we can deal with them together in a, in a blunt, quite frankly, format that's uh, respectful of everyone, but really gets to the heart of the issue. And the final thing we do is give them intelligence. There's a, of course, not classified, but we give them uh, intelligence to help protect their flocks and, and they feed the grants formula. We give out between uh, nine and $11 million per year of grant money that goes directly to the faith-based uh, initiatives and faith-based groups directly to a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, a church. And, and that, uh, that becomes vital. And again, things like, things like locks and cameras and alarms, you know, when we talk about stopping attacks, that's the money piece. And then the intelligence yep. piece that really helps us try to get ahead of these and stop these attacks. So we know they feel comfortable reporting to us because we do have that relationship. They're not meeting the attorney general of New Jersey, the director of Homeland Security, the colonel of the state police. They're meeting us in a blue sky day well before one of these incidents, God forbid, happens in our state. Well, I know you're bumping up against your, your commitment. So if you want to jump off, Jared, uh, you're welcome to. I want to thank you for participating. And, and I'll wrap up with Weldon and, and Rachel. All right, great. Thanks. Appreciate it, General. Stay safe. Stay safe, Director. Uh, Weldon, um, question for you. Um, you know, we talked about collaboration and partnership across the state. Uh, do you work with our federal partners as well when some of these cases might have a, a broader footprint? And, and how is that relationship? Uh, yes, we do. We, we certainly work with our federal partners and we've been communicating that with them as recently as last week to make sure that, again, our targets, are, we deconflict our targets and more, more than that, share resources. They have resources that they've loaned to us for these investigations and we have resources that we've also given to them. And, and we're also, too, we house a lot of data and information that we can give and share with their organization about certain groups and individuals. Uh, the uh, uh, director uh, Maples had mentioned um, these white supremacy organizations, and, and I had mentioned earlier about the fertile ground that COVID-19 uh, sort of uh, gives these individuals for recruitment. Uh, just like any organization, their lifeblood is recruitment. If we can sort of cut off some of the supply of their recruitment, we can sort of cut off some of uh, the, the activity and, some, and, and, and sort of limit what these organizations do. Excuse me. I, I, there's a, a viewer question, uh, and I think it's a good one to wrap up on. So I'll start with Weldon, and then I'll, I'll kick it to Rachel for her concluding thoughts. Um, and the question is pretty basic. If someone says they don't see race, what would you say to that person or someone else who thinks that view is not biased? It's a tough one, huh? That's a, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, that could... That's a difficult one in the sense that I think we all have our implicit bias and we have to work towards and acknowledge what it is that we're implicitly biased about. And, and part of that is acknowledgement of you know, some of our implicit bias. And I would like to think that we're moving towards that the society that doesn't see race or doesn't see color, but I don't know that we're there yet. Rachel, any thoughts on that? Yes, I'll just say um, I think we're far from there, um, and I think saying that um, someone doesn't see race personally, um, whatever that means as to their own awareness of their own implicit biases, because as I said, implicit biases operate on a subconscious level. And so um, implicit bias does not mean that someone goes out in the morning um, intending to see race or intending to see religion or intending to see um, weight even and to think that that makes a difference. Instead, these are unconscious associations um, in our brains that we're not aware of. So 
Um, I don't think, even if someone is not aware and believes that on a conscious level they don't see race, that is not the same as saying that their brains are not making any associations based on race. But I think more important than that, I think that that is just denying the systemic racism that we talked about and that our country has been um, discussing um, in recent weeks because of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. Um, and so systemic racism is not about individuals seeing race, it is about the systems um, that exist at our, in our country, some of which, as I explained with the housing example, started many, many years ago, dating all the way back, uh, 401 years ago, dating all the way back to um, slavery. Um, the systems that exist in our country um, pursuant to which um, race is an important part of what makes it possible for people of color to participate equally in society and in the economy. So I don't think that even if an individual says that he or she does not see race, that does not mean that our country as a whole does not have um, a serious issue with systemic racism that we need to all address together. Yeah, I mean, I you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question. These are tough conversations that we're having and i think all of you have touched on this is that these are conversations that we need to have we need to lean into these conversations and understand each other better and and, and so we can treat each other better um you know i i think it's okay to see race right i see your race you see my race you see my background i, I wear it openly i can't hide from it you could see me uh, and you and, and that's fine uh but i think the important thing whether it's consciously or subconsciously is that you never want it to inform your actions, that you're, you're, you're treating someone differently or you're treating them in a disparate manner um, because of that difference, right? It, it's okay to honor our differences and live our differences and, and respect our differences so long as we don't let it infect uh, our decision-making in a negative way. Um, you know, and I think that's important, you know, and it's important for us to acknowledge. Um, but if there's silver linings in the tragedies that we're experiencing in the conversation where difficult conversations uh, we're having is that is that we're coming together and we're talking about these issues that I think for too often uh, we, we've tried uh, not to acknowledge and deal with. So again, uh, to both of you, uh, thank you for the incredible work that you do on a daily basis for this state. Um, our criminal justice system, our, our law enforcement officers are in good hands thanks to Weldon's leadership. Uh, and our Division on Civil Rights uh, is, is in great hands uh, because, Rachel, you're stepping up for our 9 million residents uh, and fighting uh, back against discriminatory conduct and housing and employment in so many different areas and being proactive. Uh, and clearly more work needs to be done. So I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their schedule today. I apologize for the late start. We had some technical difficulties. I invite you back for another uh, difficult conversation next week on June 24th at 12 p.m. as we kick off uh, our discussion about use of force. Uh, we're in the midst of revising our state's use of force policy for the first time in 20 years, and 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 Chief Powell is going to be a central player in that discussion, uh, as will all stakeholders uh, and, and all uh, residents of this state. But we want everyone to have a, an understanding of what our current policy is. Uh, and John Parham, uh, the former Linden police chief, who's an expert in this space will help us uh, talk through some of these issues uh, so we could have a, a, an informed discussion as we look to create a policy that reflects our values uh, today and represents what New Jersey stands for uh, today. And so we look forward to that conversation. Uh, thank you all and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thanks, Weldon. Thanks, Rachel.